Ah, oh, there's the digital lady that says this meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides. Give me one second. So can everyone see those slides? Thumbs up. Thank you very much. Great stuff. So I'm Steve Heath. I am co-founder of a business called Mental Health in Business. Um, we help businesses of all shapes and sizes create what we call psychologically safe workplaces. Um, that's me. Um, I've actually got that image on my business card and not too long ago, um, I actually gave this out at a networking meet meeting and uh, somebody actually asked me if I was a laughing yoga teacher. So I thought that was quite funny. It made me uh, made me laugh. That's me. There are my details. Um, and you'll see my details at, at the end of, of this session as well. So I'm just going to just give me one second to. So a short introduction, really, I've mentioned that we work with businesses large and small to help them create psychologically safe workplaces. And we do that by working with our clients to design and roll out well-being programs. So typically we'll work with uh, businesses large and small initially over a year but with some clients. We work with them over a longer period of time and we've got a lot of experience. Um, we started the work that um, we do we started back in 2018 and i mean you know a lot has, a lot has changed since then um so i'm going to bring that experience with me today and um, do my best to uh, fulfill these objectives that we can see so um after attending this session you will hopefully be able to describe the role of a mental health first aider to a friend. So this session is going to start with what is mental health first aid? Some people may have heard of mental health first aid, others not. Um, it is quite common. Um, so you'll be able to describe the role of a mental health first aider to a friend. Um, looking down the list, you'll be able to understand what makes a good mental health first aider in our experience in my experience so i'm giving you my opinion there from um the experience that we've gained uh, training a lot of mental health first aiders and working with our corporate clients um you'll be able to give examples of how mental health first aider can have a positive impact on well-being in the workplace and then finally be able to summarize the components of a successful organizational well-being strategy gosh that's a bit of a mouthful. That's where we're going to end up. Um, so I hope you enjoy uh, enjoy the session. What do I mean by psychologically safe workplace? Ultimately, we're talking about workplaces. We're moving towards a situation where, in the workplace, um, there are they are good places to work where people feel as if they can. Um, talk about how they are feeling, talk about their experience, even outside of work. We are whole human beings. We bring our experiences, whether we like it or not, um, from uh, outside of work. You know, it's impossible sometimes to separate. So um, really what we're looking at here is how best to, um, to really create uh, the those psychologically safe workplaces, good places to work, and and good mental health and well being um, is is so 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 important. And obviously, it's a hot hot topic. Um, so, just a little bit more about me, really. Why am I here? What am I doing here in front of you? How did I end up here? Um, so, I'll do my best to condense a lot of years into a very short space of time. Um, I share openly that personally throughout my life, I have experienced my own mental health challenges and what that looked like for me was from a young age. Um, I always remember feeling very, very on edge for a start going all the way back to even pre teenage years. Um, 
And ultimately throughout my life, I have cycled with depression. I have cycled with bouts of depression and I've experienced a lot of anxiety and I've been through a big journey personally to get where I am now. Thankfully, so much better than where I was even six or seven years ago. And I feel like I'm in a very, uh, I feel honored um, and I'm in a privileged position to be here today, to be able to share this information with you and ultimately to be able to make um, a, a small difference uh, really um, and an impact. Um, it's important that we are, we raise awareness um, and we are open and honest about things like poor mental health to reduce stigma, which can of course prevent people from speaking up, from um, getting help in the first place. Um, so that's just a little bit more about me and why I, I do this. I'm a trained coach, um, emotional health and well-being coach. Um, I do a lot of one-to-one -one work with people as well as the organizational stuff um, that, that I do. I've done some training with the Samaritans as well. Um, and what else? There's something else. Obviously, um, yeah, the, the other thing is I'm a mental health first aid uh, instructor. So I've got a little bit of experience delivering the training that I'm going to be talking about. So those are the objectives. Um, so really, I just want to set the scene. And in order to do that, I'm going to get in the time machine and go back to 2017. So in 2017, the then Prime Minister Theresa May commissioned a report and that report um, was carried out by Lord Dennis Stevenson uh, and Paul Farmer. I think Paul Farmer is the CEO of Mind. Um, uh, that's uh, one of the main mental health charities. Um, and that report was called Thriving at Work, the Stevenson Farmer Review. Um, you'll see that there's a download link there. I'm going to supply um, the slides so that you'll have access to this and you'll be able to research this and go off and read the report. It really was a seminal piece of work, in my opinion, um, uh, back in 2017. And it really kind of laid uh, the, the foundations really for this, um, this work that we do in the well-being space, well-being at work. The summary um, is of that review is that the UK was then facing a huge mental health challenge at work, and it was much larger than at first thought. Um, what came out of that report was a number of core standards which businesses, large and small, can implement at a relatively low cost, to be honest. Um, and those core standards were aimed at businesses large and small. Um, and there are six core standards for everybody, for all businesses. And then there are four core standards, which are known as the enhanced standards. And the whole idea was that the enhanced standards are for the larger um, blue chip, uh, the larger organizations, basically. So something for everyone. Um, and we're going to park that there. We're going to come back to those core standards when we, um, when we, uh, after we've introduced, after I've introduced what mental health first aid's all about. Um, it makes sense to revisit that towards the end uh, of this session. So, look, poor mental health is expensive. Being unhappy and living in stress and anxiety is expensive. Lying sleepless at night, racked with worries is expensive. Um, poor mental health is expensive. And I'm talking there, of course, about the human costs, which we can't really quantify. Um, so what about the, you know, the human costs are huge. What about the costs to businesses um, in monetary terms, um, as well as the misery that poor mental health can bring? There is a huge knock on effect for us all, for society, for the economy um, and the government. 
um, and for everyone. And I just wanted to pose a question. And the question is on the next slide. What do you think the cost is to employers for poor mental health each year? Um, and if you wanted to put your uh, answer in the chat, just to guess, I'll give you a clue. It's in the billions. Um, so if you, uh, it would just give you a couple of minutes, really, just to give you a little bit of a guess. What do you think the cost to employers for poor mental health is each year? So I can see there's a few in the chat. I actually can't see the responses. Um, they may be they may be questions. I, I can see them, Rich, uh, Steve. Anyway, so I'll um, I'll tell you. Cool. So any uh, any guesses then uh, which have arrived in the okay. chat? Okay, uh, from um, Daisy Daisy Silcock, fifteen billion. Mm -hmm. From Jamie Banks, ten billion. Yep. Wendy Roberts, six billion. Owen Jones, twenty billion. Mm -hmm. Antonio, 22 billion. Uh, Nick Jones, 50 billion. Uh, and Colin Murray, um, 16 billion. Wow. Oh, and from John Jones, 45 billion. Lots of billions. It's a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you for all right. your guesses. Thank you for your input there. Um, it's great to get people's feedback in the chat. Okay. So, in the same year of that report in 2017, um, we're still in the time machine, a report by Deloitte called Mental Health and Employers, the Case for Investment, estimated the cost of poor mental health to employers. They estimated it between 33 and 42 billion each year. Gosh, like I'm not a researcher or statistician. I can't even say that word. Um, I don't know how they work these things out. I know there is, I know about some of the components within that. Obviously, the obvious one is absenteeism. The other one is presenteeism, where people are showing up to work, but they're unfit. Um, they're unwell for work. People are just still showing up. Um, and there are other, a lot of other factors there. As I say, I'm no expert in that area, but that's a lot of, that's a big cost. Um, and just to let you know, we're going to jump in that time machine now and pretty much come to the present moment that that Deloitte report has been updated in April this year. Um, and it's gone up and it's gone up to 52 billion, I believe. Um, any of these reports I can follow up. Um, I can give you the links. You can go and search this information um, for yourself. Why talk about the cost to business, the monetary costs? Um, because in business, we have to make a solid business case for investment. Um, we have to convince the powers that be, uh, the CEO, the CFO, the leadership team, that investing in workplace well-being is worth it. And that's really the, the reality that we live in today. And it makes sense. Uh, businesses and leadership need to have an idea of uh, return on investment. And after all, staying in business and making good financial decisions uh, keeps us all in employment. There's a really strong link between financial health um, and financial uh, well-being and our mental well-being. Those two are, I think the word is inextricably linked. I hope that's the, the right word to use there. Um, so that's why we're talking uh, briefly about uh, the, the money side of things, really. So moving on to the next slide, why is it important that we're having this conversation about mental health now, mental health in the workplace? I think we can all agree that the times we are living in right now are very unpredictable. And the last few years, when, it come, when it's come to uh, the COVID crisis, lockdown, uh, restrictions, isolation. Um, some of us have lost loved ones. Um, we've all been impacted in uh, lots of different ways. Relationships have been strained, broken, 
Um, livelihoods have been at stake, uh, and for many, it's been really, really difficult. Um, moving forward, you know, how can we, as individuals to begin with, um, acknowledge that and move forward and create a life that we want, a life with meaning and a life with purpose, ultimately meaning, purpose, um, in my experience, has a lot to do with individual and collective uh, happiness. And I just think at this stage um, of life, I know that I'm doing this personally and have done this personally. Look, re I think we're in a phase of reassessing after all of this. Are we coming out of this? Looks like it. Um, there are a lot, there, obviously there are other things. It seemed as if we'd been out of the frying pan into the fire, uh, so to speak. So we do live in fairly unpredictable times. And of course that has an impact on mental health, uh, and wellbeing. Um, the bottom line is that because of the last few years, depression and anxiety as mental health conditions has doubled among the population because of all that stuff that I've just been talking about. And that's just reported cases. There are many people who are um, struggling to uh, perhaps cope on their own. They're not speaking up, they're not speaking out. So that's why it's important that we're having this conversation, that we're doing this session, and that we are going to be moving into talking about what do we do about it? What do we do about mental health and well-being in the workplace? Um, and that's where the discussion comes in about mental health first aid. Um, so just looking at the stats there, I mentioned that depression had doubled. Uh, ONS, so this is information from the ONS. Uh, there's going to be a link that's going to show up shortly, and I'm going to share that with you. So almost one in five adults were likely to be experiencing some form of depression during coronavirus. Uh, that's June 2020. That had almost doubled from one in 10 before the pandemic. One in eight developed moderate to severe depressive symptoms during the pandemic. And young adults aged 16 to 39 were worst affected. Uh, that's the link there. Look, there are, I believe, people out there right now who are experiencing poor mental health and the right support at the right time would help them massively. There are, of course, there are people with existing mental health conditions who uh, are familiar with uh, symptoms of poor mental health, but there are a lot of people out there who um, have never experienced poor mental health and they are doing so uh, for the first time, really. So that's why this is really an important conversation to have. And um, it's why the, it's why I do the work, why we do the work uh, that we do. I just want to put a disclaimer in here that um, the presentation and what I'm talking about isn't all about the doom and the gloom. You know, there's a lot of, there's, the, I've just spoken a lot there about depression doubling, for example, and what we've all been through. Um, and it's really important just to, you know, make these points. They're really salient. They're really, uh, they really make sense, but we're really going to move into, you know, what are we going to do about this? So what is our, what can we do about this? Essentially? What, where's the hope? Where's the humanity, uh, in all of this? Um, it's up to us as human beings to make sure Yes, this is a conversation which is uh, more popular. Yes, awareness is raised and is being raised. Um, but it's important that um, well-being isn't treated just as a box ticking exercise. Um, and we as a business, mental health in business, when we first started up, that was one of our kind of key beliefs, really, that we don't want to be a business who enables other businesses to do that. Um, hopefully you can't hear my dogs barking in the background. Um, if you can, I must apologize. I've got a little whippersnapper 
it, that's his classic sort of Zoom um, uh, uh, all together, isn't it? The world that we're living in, dogs barking in the background. Um, so, so here we are then, we're going to move on. We're going to move on to, um, we're going to move on to what is mental health first aid. And of course, if you've got any questions about anything that I've covered, please feel free to put those in the chat and then they're going to be fielded at the end of this. And I am more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I love that part. I love answering questions. So let's just quickly look at what mental health first aid is. Um, and it makes sense to me to just quickly look at, well, what is first aid? We're all, um, you know, as health and safety professionals, we'll all be um, familiar with first aid and what it is. And just a reminder up there, really, the aims of first aid are to preserve life, to prevent further harm, promote recovery, provide comfort to a person who is ill or injured. So how does that compare then to mental health first aid? So the aims of MHFA are two. I'm just reading off the slide here and I can, I just need to move people's faces. There you go. So the aims of me, uh, uh, mental health first aid are to preserve life where a person may be at risk of harm to themselves or others. I'm just going to move to the next point. Uh, to provide help to prevent the mental health issue from becoming more serious. To promote recovery of good mental health. To provide uh, comfort to a person with a mental health issue. So there's some similarities there, um, which I thought were were worth were were worth just it was just worth making that um, comparison. So as well as those aims there on the right hand column, MHF, the, the wider aims of MHFA are to raise awareness of mental health issues in the community. And that's really important. And to reduce stigma and discrimination. We all know the power, really, that stigma and discrimination has, the negative impact that can have on people opening up, for example, people getting help in the first place. Um, so those other aims really are really important and the bottom line is the absolute bottom line is here is that mental health first aiders are not mental health professionals just as a physical first aider wouldn't fix a broken leg a mental health first aider does not treat and diagnose mental health conditions that is absolutely not what it's about Instead, MHFA training teaches people how to spot the early signs of mental health issues developing. Potentially, it's preventable. It's a prevention that we can put in place in the workplace. Um, I believe it can and does save lives. Um, it teaches people in the workplace how to look out for and what to look out for, the warning signs. Um, it teaches people to spot if somebody is in a crisis um, and importantly, how to deal with a crisis, what to do, the things to say. Um, we tell everyone um, in our MHFA training courses to resist the temptation to go out and start diagnosing themselves um or other people it's really tempting um to do that but it's not what the training is all about so it's really about providing that initial support being there that for that person assessing the situation for, for example if someone is in crisis then it's highly likely that they would need professional help there and then um, and within the course mental health crisis is covered um, and if it's not a crisis so is if, if someone is experiencing ongoing poor mental health symptoms and that's been spotted in the workplace and people who've done the training are more equipped really 
um, in deciding and helping um, that person and really encouraging them to take some positive steps in the right direction when it comes to getting support and ultimately um, recovery, really getting that person in the right direction when it comes to recovering from poor mental health. So there are a number of organizations out there that offer their version of mental health first aid training. So as a business, we are licensed by MHFA England to deliver MHFA England courses. Uh, I can't comment on any of the other organizations uh, because I, have, I haven't done their training. Um, I am a licensed, uh, I'm a licensed instructor for MHFA England. Um, one thing I can say is that MHFA England, and this is the reason why we chose them to chose to go with them, is that their instructor program is the only one that is recognised by the Royal Society of Public Health. Um, it was the only one the last time that I checked, and we thought that that was a great seal of approval um, and a good sort a good indicator of credibility really the training uses a robust uh, evidence based and it's um it's, it's mental health first aid um england there is an international organization behind them and it's in i think 42 different countries and it's a very widely accepted i would say industry standard when it comes to mental health and well-being in the workplace um, so there's a point here I want to make really, um, mental health first aid as a training could become a legal requirement in the future. And the reason I say that is in April, uh, in April, 2021. So gosh, that was, um, April, 2021. That was a while ago, a new bill that would make mental health first aid training in the workplace a legal requirement moved into its second reading in Parliament. And the bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 23rd of March by Dean Russell, MP, who wants a new law to ensure that every workplace has a mental health first aider. So I'm sure as health and safety professionals, you all know, of course you do. I'm not preaching to the choir. It's a legal uh, operation it's a legal obligation to provide training for first aid uh, injuries or illness under the health and safety regulations act 1981 um, there is a move towards there is a dialogue there is a debate um, there is motivation for making mental health first aid um, a legal requirement in the workplace um, so it's well worth having that on our radar. The motivation is good. Um, the debate goes on. There are arguments for and against, uh, as well as question marks over the evidence base uh, for the effectiveness of MHFA over all the training methods. You can go and read about this. You can watch a video about this. I can give you the link. Uh, we know as an organization, mental health in business knows as an organization the mental health first aid training on its own in isolation is nowhere near as effective as taking a wider approach to mental health in the workplace we just know that um, from experience so what i'm saying is mhfa on a low uh, on you know on its own as a box ticking exercise uh, we believe isn't it enough and there are many other organizations who agree with us so that's really a good hopefully a good kind of overview of um what mental health first aid is and i've introduced mental health first aid england as an organization that you could certainly go and uh, look at um and what i want to do now is just really focus in on what I believe what we see as an organization makes a good mental health first aider. Just to say that during the last five years, we've trained hundreds of mental health first aiders. And over that time, as a trained coach, I've worked with people 
a lot of people one-to-one -one after we've done the training. So what we do as a, an organization, one of the core um, kind of core beliefs that we've got, what we really stand for is that we don't leave people behind. So we don't train people and then that's it. We support people after that, which is really, really important to do. We support everyone who we um, put through the MHFA training. And so I've spoken to a lot, hundreds and hundreds of people who we've trained. Um, so personally, I've gained my own understanding, really, of what makes a good mental health first aider. And I'm going to share that information with you um, now. Um, so the attributes the qualities of what I believe, what we believe makes a good mental health first aider. The first one is approachable. So we all know someone who in our place of work or somebody who we know is really approachable, easy to talk to, trustworthy. Um, it's common sense that approachability makes it much easier for colleagues to be more open, be more honest about how they're feeling. Um, it was only a few weeks ago, we were training a cohort of mental health first aiders. There was 12, uh, 12 people, all from the same organization. And one person in particular uh, really shone through as being very warm and approachable. Um, and there was a running joke within the group, remember, remember these are in the same organization, that this person was known uh, for being the mother uh, in the office. and. Uh, I thought that was quite comical, really. Um, but there was a real warmth and they got a real sense of her approachability. Um, she is a natural. Um, not, that's not always possible, depending on the size of the business. This was actually quite a sizable business. Um, we were actually training people from the UK as well as abroad. So we had people from Italy, uh, somebody from Greece. It was a fantastic group. Um, Approachability can be something that we can develop as human beings. Yes, we can have uh, natural approachability, um, but I think that's really a key attribute um, to consider when we're thinking about what makes a good mental health first aider is common sense. The next thing that I just want to uh, say is that listening skills are absolutely essential. Um, I used to think that I was amazing at listening uh, before I did any training, before I did any coach training. Coaching and mentoring is a lot about listening to people. Um, and I wonder if you think about yourself in that way. It's, such, it's, it's so easy to think that we can almost assume that we're great listeners. Um, and I'll always remember, I actually did some listening uh, training with the Samaritans and um, that's when I really realized that I was a rubbish, absolutely rubbish listener. We don't get taught listening skills at school. We get taught reading, we get taught writing, but listening skills are way down on the list. And actually um, what I've come to believe and what I've come to learn in my own life really is listening skills. Uh, I think they're further up the list there. Um, it's important as a mental health first day that we can put ourselves to one side, um, forget what's going on up here, forget about ourselves and listen to somebody non-judgmentally. Um, that's an art form. It can be uh, developed. We all have judgments as human beings, absolutely natural. It's great to be aware of whatever judgments we have, put them to one side and we are in a much better place to listen in order to understand rather than what a lot of us do, me included, unconsciously. Um, I often, I still catch myself, I listen to respond. So we cover that in the training, that's covered in the training, kind of listening skills are really, really important. The bottom line, to be a good mental health first aider, you have to be able to put yourself to one side, listen carefully, and non-judgmentally. The next attribute is this idea of being empathic or having empathy. Again, common sense. I believe that as human beings, 
we are inherently good. And I choose to see the good in people. And I've found that the alternative, this is my own opinion, this is my own life experience. I found that the alternative, and I used to think like this, seeing the bad in people, seeing the negatives, being cautious around people, kept me cynical. Ultimately, it kept me small. Um, and I was more likely to hide away from the world. So these days, uh, I choose to see the good in people. And that is a great place to start, not only as a mental health first aider, but as a human being. And what I will say is that what I've just shared with you there flies in the face of the messages that we are given day in, day out. All we have to do is switch on the TV and we can see, we can get 24 hour news coverage of how terrible humans are. Um, so don't get me wrong there are bad things happening out there in the world um but right now keeping separate from others in fear cautious making that assumption that people are in some way out to get us or we're isolated or separate from other people i believe that is actually the root cause of anxiety for a lot of people isolation separation what's the solution community. I think we've lost it. I think we've lost it. Um, a little bit more on that later. I, I feel passionate about that subject, really. Community. Going back to um, um, going back to the empathy side of things. Being able to feel genuine empathy for others makes a good mental health first aider. Um, it's not as hard as you might think, um, given that I think there's a universal human law, really, that we like people who are like us. So in the workplace, we are working with people who are like us. We've got what have we got in common? We work with them. We are colleagues. We have common ground. And that's a good starting place. Um, just on that point there that I made about seeing choosing to see the good in people rather than the opposite i'd love to share a book title with you which is all about that which is called humankind um i've recently read it it's fantastic um and that really gave me the inspiration to share that with you i haven't got the author so i don't know if anyone wants to google that and put that in the chat it's called humankind um i fully recommended it especially in this time of chaos it really does bring a light aside. Um, it's a great read. I recommend it. So moving on, what other attributes makes a good mental health first aider? Confidence, setting boundaries. Healthy boundaries are a must as a mental health first aider. Um, after the training, people in organizations become more visible as the go-to person for others and it's important to set clear boundaries for the role and for those who approach and choose to um to 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 open up about their own what's going on for them um to open up about their own mental health issues so it's really important to as an organization to have a clear organizational role specification. We work with our clients always to provide that. Um, and as a side note, really, uh, as an organization, we offer what we call MHFA surgeries, which um, we run with the client and we discuss things around boundary setting. Boundary setting is a skill um to develop not only just as a mental health first aid a bit in life generally um people who gravitate towards i'm going to say heart-centered um approach you know supporting people helping people they can be the sorts of people who say yes to everything um so it's really important to have a good healthy skill when it comes to uh, uh setting boundaries really really important um, the bottom line there is that with boundaries, um, early on, a mental health first aider would explain 
what their role is to the person that they're supporting and what they can do, um, how they can help. The main point being that they are there to encourage professional support. They aren't the professionals um, as well as other supports. So the professional supports we're talking about are um, if the person isn't in, if the person is in crisis, then we are there to help them get professional support in the form of um, emergency services. Of course, we're there to stay with them, ultimately help them in a crisis. But also, if they're not in a crisis, they're so they're experiencing poor mental health uh, chronically, uh, consistently, and you've noticed that. Um, then the mental health first data is there to offer other supports such as um, signposting, signposting to a company uh, employee assistance program, occupational health, HR, um, and anything else that the business has already got in place. And also mental health first aiders um, are trained to build their own resources locally and give people pointers um, and encouragement to seek things like local community self-help groups, things like good podcasts to listen to. The manual that um, people are supplied with when they do the training is amazing. It's huge and it's there's so many resources there that mental health first aiders are uh, sent away with really, and that they can use to support people who are, um, who have symptoms of poor mental health, who may be um, in need of support there and then. So that's the thing on the, uh, on the boundaries there. That's the, that's what I wanted to say there. I'm just going to reveal if there are any more, I think there are a few more. Um, Reliable and trustworthy really ties in with being approachable. You can't have those and not be approachable. Um, trustworthiness is something that obviously is developed over time. Managers talk about that a lot. Um, it's really important to have that in place. Absolutely. People are more likely to open up. So those really, that's just an overview of what I believe. My opinion um, given the experience that I and we've had as a business, those qualities there, which I just wanted to uh, share with you. So I've got another question and I'm going to field it to the room. How do you think mental health first aid can make a positive impact in the workplace? Given all of the stuff that I've just shared with you, I would love just to receive a few uh, responses. Uh, if there are any responses appearing in the chat, I'd be really interested um, what you thought. So how do you think mental health first aid can make a positive impact on the workplace? And I wonder if there are any chat uh, responses landing, Richard. Not yet. Not yet. People can take a while to respond. Um, sometimes people have chat faces. <laughs> okay. We've got one already from uh, Jamie Banks. Engage workforce by non-judgmental listening. Yeah, absolutely. Any more for any more? Oh, from Stuart Wright. It demonstrates the workforce that the employer takes the mental health issue seriously yeah and for mike roberts uh, encourages people to talk and be aware of how help is available absolutely some great points there think about this what is what what um signal is being sent from an organization to employees if employees are being trained as mental health first aiders I think it sends a message that we care, that we are looking out for you. Um, as long as mental health first aid training and any training for that matter, isn't treated as a box 
ticking exercise. Sometimes I think that can be the danger, really, especially when legislation gets brought in. I mentioned legislation earlier. We're not quite there yet, and there's a big debate going about that. It'd be great to get people's thoughts and opinions on that um, towards um, the end. We've had one from Antonio to say, um, I work in a high-demand job. Sometimes they need that phone operator they are speaking to to help them deal with a hard time. Mm. Um, Brilliant. Um, I'm a phone operator and pass work to field personnel. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's yeah. a great, great point. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that feedback. So look, rather than, um, rather than showing you like a, a big list of um, things, um, when it comes to, you know, making that positive impact, what I wanted to do is share with, share with you a real story of an experience that I had from doing a one-to-one -one session with somebody who, it was very recently, somebody who we did, uh, who we trained, who I trained um, as a mental health first aider. So, so it was earlier this year, we trained a cohort of mental health first aiders. Again, there was about 12 people on the session. And two weeks after, I sent out the invites to everyone um, for a follow-up call. So I mentioned that we do this as a business, something that we feel really passionate about, to give that support to the mental health first aiders within their new role. So as a coach, um, I do a lot of those calls. I absolutely love it. I love one-to-one -one work. Um, and I love checking in with the people that we've trained and how they're taking this out there into the world. Um, and instantly in this case, one of the attendees booked a session like that straight away. Um, and we'll call her, um, I've anonymized this, um, I can't say that word, anonymized, there we go. And we'll call her Jane. So we spoke We spoke the next day, I spoke to Jane the next day and we did a one-to-one -one session. And she said that our call couldn't have come at a better time. She told me about a colleague with an existing mental health condition who she was really worried about. So what I mean by an existing mental health condition is that it was known that this individual who we're going to call Claire, she had a known, uh, she had a mental health condition, which was, she had a diagnosis. It was known to HR, it was known to the business. So the reason why she was so worried and why this call was so timely was because the week previously, Claire, who is the person who had the, the, the diagnosis essentially, um, she, start, she started to behave quite differently in the office. And one day she came back after lunch, she came back with an injury, um, which it looked like had a homemade dressing on this injury. She was clearly distressed. Um, so Jane, who had done the training, was able to take her to one side to um, open up the conversation with her, which ultimately resulted in Claire getting immediate professional help. Jane took time to listen and understand um, about what happened. Um, and what I'm going to share with you now is um, she had actually self-harmed during a break and she'd come back to work in a panic. So what Jane did is she didn't leave her. She spoke with Claire's immediate family, um, which is encouraged. So anyone else who could support her. Um, and she actually drove Claire home. And subsequently Claire went to a &E and she got professional medical support. So on our call, on this call, we went through this. Um, Jane, we, she, she was, she wanted to have the call with me because she was kind of shook. You know, this is, and this is an extreme example. I've come across this once. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, um, 
I wanted to share it with you because it's a very real uh, situation which impacted me and it showed me really the the power of the training and what it can do, the power of having a mental health first aiders. So Jane was able to get that professional medical support and she is in ongoing um, support. Um, and I was able to then support the person that we trained, Jane, um, to go through the steps that she took and really spend, I spent the rest of the session with her reassuring her that the steps that she had taken, um, were absolutely spot on. So, as I say, rather than give you a load of lists of what would the, uh, I just wanted to share that story with you because I thought it, it certainly impacted me. Um, so clearly it's an extreme example that I've given you there. You're not going to come across that often, but it's a possibility. Um, so Jane had taken the skills that she'd learned on the training and she'd applied them in a crisis situation. Um, so generally mental health first aiders, they are more equipped than those who haven't done the training to be able to support people in a crisis, which I've just shared with you. And they uh, form an important part of an employee support network. There's a really, really important part of this, which we'll move on to when we start looking into what is a good well-being strategy is if there isn't a wider support network in as part of a well-being strategy, then that's not good news. So the MHFAs are an important part of a wider support network when it comes to well-being strategy. So all the things to quickly note before we move on regarding the impact of having mental health first aiders in the workplace. We've mentioned, one of you mentioned, think about the positive message it sends to everyone in the organization. Ultimately, the work that we do with organizations is we're working with them to change the culture of our mental health and well-being. A lot of organizations, some, some organizations have done nothing about this. Um, there can be uh, stigma present. Um, so, you know, having mental health first aiders can be a, a really positive message to really kickstart culture change, um, to be honest. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you is having mental health first aiders promotes an open culture. In other words, you are more likely to create a culture of community. There's that word again, so, so important. Personally, I am discovering for myself the importance of community. Um, and personally, I am looking into ways to create community myself. Um, feel really passionate about that. I think it's the answer to a poor mental health epidemic which was happening even before the pandemic. Last point here is that the younger generation coming into the workplace, they actually expect different things. Um, they expect different things in the workplace, which include having a focus on well-being. Um, having mental health first aiders goes some way to answer in those expectations, which in turn can help retain talent. Gosh, some industries have a real difficulty with retaining talent. I was talking to somebody the other day. Um, I think it's fairly common knowledge that in the logistics industry, really difficult to bring young uh, people on board. Um, so that's just a little example there, just some more points there that I wanted to, to share with you. So according to my timer, I think we're on about roughly 50 minutes or so. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so um, just looking briefly at what does a successful well-being strategy look like. Um, and I'm just going to give you an overview, really, of what, what I've discovered, what we've discovered as an organization, what works. Um, and a few little uh, pointers on what doesn't work. So I hope so far you're getting some value from this and getting some good, solid, grounded information. Um, that is certainly my purpose being here today. Um, 
What makes a successful well-being strategy? This is a really new thing that businesses are embarking on. Some businesses have done a lot. We come across businesses who, who have done nothing. And of course, that's where we come in. In our experience, this is what doesn't work. I've mentioned already a tick box approach. Some businesses do take a tick box approach to quite a few things. So it's important that we're aware of that. And it's important that we move away from that. You know, what's the alternative to a box ticking exercise? It's a much more joined up approach. So there's the joined up approach. So what doesn't work is having no structure or a clear vision on the wider picture, ultimately a strategy. So we always advise when, because a lot of businesses approach us and say, we want to train X amount of people in mental health first aid. Um, and what we do is essentially we get on a, a call with them to really understand what is it they're trying to achieve. Um, and we advise against just doing mental health first aid training. Um, we advise to um, consider some of the other components that I'm going to share with you. Another thing that doesn't work is having key people in the organization not being on board. We deal with it. Um, it's important that, you know, we all, as an organization, we actually help, we help people who are driving change within organizations. We help people who are the leaders when it comes to driving change. Um, but we all know in organizations, large and small, um, there are people who they might not be on board. They might not see the value in investing in uh, mental health and well-being interventions, for example. So because of that reason and stigma and other reasons, key people um, not being on board, it can get in the way. So it's important that we're aware of that and it's important that we figure out what we do about that to get to speak to those people, to communicate, to send the right messages and get people on board. Dead obvious there, a toxic culture. Um, it's quite a broad statement, really, a toxic culture. I don't know about you, but I've worked in a few. Um, and if there is that toxic culture there, then that can really get in the way of um, a well-being strategy, being successful. So look, let's not hang around here. We don't want to hang around on what doesn't work any longer. So what does make a successful well-being strategy? So in our experience, this is what does work. A bespoke approach. So it's not a box ticking exercise, as I've, as I've just said. We work with clients to really understand their industry. What are the hot spots? What is going on for you in your industry? Um, where are people up against challenges. Challenges might be the culture. So the culture could be the challenge. So having that bespoke tailored approach, really getting to know what the um, what the lay of the land is internally within your organization. And of course, you know, I'll say this a million times, we help uh, businesses get their head around that. Obviously, I mentioned leadership, I mentioned key people, key figures being on board. When they are on board, and this is coming from the top, it's really important. It's really important that it's coming from multiple levels, um, not just preaching from the top, um, because there can be, sometimes there can be uh, what leaders say, and then what is actually happening on the ground. So it's really important to be aware of that. If leadership aren't on board, then, you know, it's not gonna work essentially. So having leadership on board, really important appropriate training and education so i've already spoken a lot about mental health first aid a, a training there's a lot of evidence out there in the world that line managers in particular are in 
a really good position when it comes to creating um, a psychologically safe workplace. I mean, clearly they're in a position where of influence, where they are mentoring people, they are managing people, um, they are coaching people, encouraging people, hopefully, to grow and develop. Um, so line managers training, line managers mental health awareness training, alongside mental health first aid training, really important. Um, and that's, of course, something that we we do as an organization. Um, and I know others do. So, you know, having um, mental health awareness training for line managers is really important. And just to let you know, so the mental health first aid training is quite detailed. It does go into specific conditions, for example. Line managers mental health awareness training. Well, what the one that we've created anyway, the series of workshops that we've created for line managers doesn't do any of that. There's no need. It focuses more on how do I uh, support my team when it comes to their mental health and well-being? Um, what are the right things to say? What are the right things to do? What are the wrong things to say? What are the wrong things to do? So that's what I mean by appropriate training and education. Um, MHFA, line managers, mental health awareness training, um, really important as part of a whole approach to well-being. So the components that I'm giving you are building up now. Just to add here, education wise, another thing that we do as an organization, which we find works really well, is we do monthly, sometimes even bi-monthly, whatever the organization wants. We do monthly light touch well-being webinars which are open to the whole organization and people join in um, and they uh, they come and learn stuff like a lot like we're doing here essentially lots of different topics topics can be chosen from and we advise this from doing things like mental health and well-being surveys employee surveys um, which are really important as well that's another important of uh, part really of a good approach to this is to have a way of um, really measuring and taking the temperature of what's going on inside the organization. So I've spoken about a support network. We work with our clients to create well-being committees, to create a sense of community which is needed to give well-being um, approaches and interventions, to give them legs, to embed them, um, to humanize them and make them real and make them impactful. Um, so form, forming peer support networks. So an example of that is I mentioned that we do mental health uh, first aid surgery sessions for our clients. Um, and they're ongoing. That's part of a, a good approach, really, to well-being strategy. That's supporting the mental health first aiders. One of the things that I hear time and time again in the work that we do is that some businesses train mental health first aiders. And there's a real danger in mental health first aiders getting visible, being the go-to person, um, and then feeling overwhelmed um, with the role for a start. Um, they're new to the role, let's face it. And also, if people are, if they're having a lot of conversations with people, uh, some people could be sharing uh, difficult challenges that they're having, uh, life experiences. It's important, super, super important that mental health first aiders have got support themselves. And that's where a well-being committee comes in. That's where a support network comes in. We encourage mental health first aiders within any organization to get together at least once a month, talk about their experiences um, and share, share their experiences 
uh, and you know we facilitate uh, essentially additional training. So we run case studies, which are bespoke to to the client. So that's um, well-being committees uh, and support network really important. Consistent internal communications. Um, communication is really important. Um, sending out internal communications to really help people, uh, help mental health first aiders be visible and really keep sending those good messages out there that ultimately um, the well-being of employees, the well-being of people is, is super, super important. And last but not least is we work with organizations to create and publish an organizational mental health philosophy. This is a really top level document. Um, it's a little bit like a declaration. It's like a manifesto. It's a really um, top level kind of call to action. And that it's important that it encompasses the kind of mission of the business and you know, we get into, uh, we get in now into really what are the values of the business? Um, how do we live those values as a business? How do we live, um, an organizational, uh, mental health philosophy? Um, it's really important to have the, one of those in place, um, and to communicate that. And that can be done at the beginning of, a uh, an intervention. And of course, the other thing that I'm going to add there, it's actually not on the list, is um, really supporting uh, HR teams with this. Uh, that's another thing that, that we do, is we support HR teams to create support pathways, which are then filtered to mental health first aiders or um, well-being champions. So businesses, some businesses choose to have what's known as well-being champions and those are people really who um they can do uh, they can do a champion training or they can just be people who care about raising awareness who care about um bringing uh, a positive mental health culture into the workplace and you know mental health first aiders and mental health champions a lot of people um have their own experiences really or i think it's safe to say that by now in our lives we all know somebody maybe even somebody close to us or it could even be ourselves who have had our own experience of of poor mental health so i just wanted to i just wanted to share that there with you so hr support and bringing in some really solid um support pathways uh approaches a pathway to follow if somebody at work an employee at work shows up um shows up with the symptoms of poor mental health um it's really important that they are supported early on um, and that really does feed into a preventative approach uh, to mental health and well-being in the workplace. So just quickly, I realize I'm probably running over a little bit here. So I just wanted to quickly mention, I mentioned earlier in this uh, session about the core standards and we're gonna come back to them. These are the, so there's six core standards which are for everybody. You can find these in the Thriving at Work report, which was carried out back in 2017. As a business, we use these guidelines uh, to inform our work with clients. These are guidelines that you can go and share with anybody and everybody right now. And they are government recommendations and they're recommended for businesses of all shapes and sizes. I'm not gonna read them out there. We are, um, you know, we are, kind of short of time I wanted to wrap this up I just wanted to give those six there um, I think the things that I've been saying so the components that I've been sharing with you you hopefully you will be able to see that some of those components are covered 
in these core standards. So these are the core standards that are encouraged really for all businesses to follow. It's a framework that we can start to follow today. We may be in a position in the future where mental health first aid, as an example, becomes um, becomes uh, legal in the workplace, if that makes sense. So just before I just before I close this off, really, and end the session and go to Q and A, they are the there are the enhanced standards. So those enhanced standards, they're there for the larger, um, huge organizations. Um, and that's an extension, really, of the framework. We think it's a fantastic framework. Some great work has been done there. And there are lots of organizations who've built on this framework. We use it, among other things. Um, so there is uh, NICE have just brought out a new framework, which is hot off the press they've brought out new recommendations when it comes to well-being um, in the workplace um, i can share information with with you on those after after this session as well so there's lots of help and support out there about how to go about creating psychologically safe workplaces about how to uh, create positive mental health and well-being culture in the workplace, how to support people uh, in the workplace. Um, so that is everything that I wanted to cover. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. And I am wondering, you see, I can't see the chat here because uh, okay. I've got my slides yeah. open and everything. Okay. Uh, so... I'm happy we've, to answer any questions, Richard. We've got plenty of questions. Mm. I'm just a bit minded that what we could do is actually um, um, collect the download the chat and yeah. actually to give us some answers on the chat on it. So when we put it onto the put the recording and the slides on the website, yeah, they've got some answers to what was in the chat function. I am. Uh, I'm, I'm just. Um, it from my side. If everybody's happy with that, it's been a great. Great talk, Steve. Much appreciated. If you wanna wanna stop sharing your screen, yeah. Um, uh, from my side to everybody, I think that was a a great insight into uh, mental health well being, but also the mental health first aiders. Um, and um, I'm quite gobsmacked. So much information there. So much information, and thanks for giving it from the heart there, Steve, as well. Oh. We noticed that that was you really gave us not just the flavor, you gave us almost a Bible of what you should be looking at. And that, that's brilliant. Huh. So um, what we'll do then with the chat, we'll download the chat. I'll send you a copy of the chat so you can answer the questions. Yep. I'm just minding that people probably want to go, either go to bed or, or go and have a drink. But um, yep. I think it was a great talk, Steve. Much appreciated to everybody. Um, I will now close the meeting. Uh, if you want to stay online, Steve, we'll have a quick chat. Um, and with, with John and Nick as well. Um, and I, I, hopefully that's giving you a flavour. We'll get everything on the website next week. Uh, that will be the slides, the chat function, question answers, and, uh, and the recording. So thank you very much. Um, Let's um, yay GMs on the 11th. So I look forward to seeing you there. Um, and apart from that, it's have a great night and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.
if you've got any questions for us, um, just um, come off, uh, unmute yourself and, and talk to us. Okay.